All right. I don't really have any announcements because the next homework isn't due until like uh, the end of next week, I think it is. Um, but do, we will have some questions, so go ahead and get logged in. Um, all right. So last time we uh, ended up talking about um, the, the heart's anatomy. And uh, we'll sort of continue that here this morning, and then we'll get into a little bit of the heart's function, particularly the cardiac cycle. All right, so when we look at the two ventricles, the left ventricle and the right ventricle, um, you know, so we've cut the heart sort of across uh, mid-ventricle, and we see some pretty significant differences, right? So this is the left ventricle here, and this is the right ventricle here. So, you know, the first thing you see is a difference in shape. You know, the, the left ventricle is very round, whereas the right ventricle has that kind of crescent moon shape to it. And the reason for that is uh, it's, it's all function. The right side of the heart has a very different job than the left side of the heart does. The, uh, the path to the lungs and back is a very low pressure, low resistance pathway. You know, the lungs are very close to the heart and the vessels that go to the lungs and come back from the lungs are pretty good size. So that makes for an easy job. So the right ventricle does not have as much work to do as the left ventricle does. So in addition to the difference in shape, we also see a difference in wall thickness. So if we look at the, the left ventricle here, we can see that the wall is very, very thick. Whereas in the right ventricle, the wall is quite thinner, you know, about half the thickness of the, the left ventricle. And there again, it has to do with um, uh, the, the job that the two sides of the heart have to do. So because the left ventricle is pumping to the body, the body system is a high pressure, high resistance system. You know why? Because you know there's a mile of blood vessels um, between the heart and uh, coming back to the heart, and um, the uh, there are lots of vessels and they're quite a bit smaller. So the, the best way to create pressure, high pressure to overcome that high resistance, is to have a round shape and then lots of cardiac muscle cells participating. So the left ventricle has this shape because it has to pump against this high resistance. So the right ventricle shape is not really on purpose. It simply is shaped by the left ventricle that's next to it. So we have thin walls and a uh, difference in shape because this round shape that the left ventricle has, that's the most efficient way to, uh, to pump or to reduce the volume of the uh, ventricle on the inside. So the left and right sides of the heart have uh, uh, some different anatomy because of their function. All right. So last time we introduced the valves, you know, we talked about the left and right AV valve and then the pulmonary and aortic valve. So in order to sort of see how these valves work, we can look at the heart in, at two stages, diastole and systole. All right, so new vocabulary word. Diastole is relaxation. Systole is contraction. And as we'll see here in a minute, both the atria and the ventricles have a diastole time and a systole time. So when we look at the heart, um, in diastole, it looks a little bit like this. Now, this view over here on the, on the left is sort of an odd view of the heart, but it shows us the valves the best. So what are we looking at? Well, we're looking down at the ventricles, but the atria have been removed. So the, the left and right atria have been removed, so we can see all four valves and what they look like. So when the ventricles are in diastole, or relaxing, the AV valves are open, so we can sort of see what they look like when they're open. So this is the right AV valve, this is the left. And here you can start to see how they get their names. So the right valve is the tricuspid, right? And there's one, two, three cusps, right? And then on the left side, it's called the bicuspid because there's just two, uh, one here and one here. And we'll see that uh, a better picture of that in uh, systole here in a minute. All right, so then we have the aortic valve and the pulmonary valves. 
This is what those valves look like when they are closed. So blood can't flow through these because all the little cups have been sort of pushed together, similar to a, a, a valve that you'd see in a vein, like we talked about um, in the last chapter. So uh, aortic valve, pulmonary valve. Then when we look at things from the side, you know, we can see here's the aortic valve. This is the left ventricle that we're looking at. Here's the aortic valve. It's closed. And the reason it's closed is because the blood in the aorta here is essentially trying to flow backwards into the heart. Well, we don't like backwards. We want blood flowing in the right direction all the time. So as the blood flows backwards, it fills these cups of the aortic valve, you know, here, or here, here, and here, and essentially slams that valve closed and, and holds it closed until blood moving in this direction at under enough pressure actually opens that valve back up. And then here uh, in the, on the AV valve, the left atrium, blood is coming in from the lungs and it's flowing into the left ventricle, which is right here. So we can see that the valve is open the chordae tendini, the little uh, parachute strings, so to speak, are sort of loose, they're not tight, because the valve isn't closed, it's open. So um, we have uh, the valves in diastole. Now when we look at the heart while it's contracting, we see the opposite. We see the AV valves closed and the aortic and pulmonary valves open. So again, looking down at the heart with the atria removed, um, what we're looking at are the AV valves in their closed position. So here again, the right AV valve is called the tricuspid, and sure enough, there's one, two, three leaflets, right? And the left AV valve, bicuspid, one, two, we have just uh, two that come together. Um, some people you know, say that the left AV valve looks a little like a mouth uh, when it's uh, closed. And then the aortic and pulmonary valves are open because the, the ventricle is pushing blood uh, now in the correct direction. So it pushes those valves open and blood is actually able to leave the heart. So when we look at it from the side, this is one of the best pictures of how these AV valves work. Okay, so here's the left atrium and here's the left ventricle. It's contracting, blood is being pushed out through the aorta. Well, as the blood is being pushed out through the aorta, blood is also being pushed up toward the left atrium, right? Because the pressure in here is greater than the pressure in here. So as that blood tries to move backwards, it becomes like the air in the parachute. You know, if the AV valves are parachutes, well, what makes the parachute open? Well, it's air fills it up and, and makes it that, you know, round shape that we're used to. Well, in the, uh, in the heart, it's blood that fills up the parachutes. So here we have our two cusps of the left AV valve, and they're being pushed, uh, or they're being filled with blood trying to move back into the left atrium. So now we can see why these chordae tendini exist. Because if it wasn't for these strings along the edge being held tightly to the heart by the papillary muscles, then these valves would just flip backwards and sort of flap, you know, just like if you let go of the strings of a parachute, you know, it just flips up into, into the breeze. Same thing here, you know, if it wasn't for these, uh, these cords, this valve wouldn't function, you know, it wouldn't stay closed, it wouldn't stay full like this. And once it fills up with blood, the two sides push together and now blood can't get out. So it forms a, an effective one-way valve. So, you know, here's our parachute open, and then in the previous slide, we saw what it looked like when it was closed, or sort of, uh, uh, you know, falling upside down, so to speak. All right. All right, so we have just a little movie here. I'm going to turn some of the lights off. Because <clears throat> we can see the heart in motion, um, and we can see these valves uh, opening and closing. All right, this should have sound, but let's see if it actually works. It's supposed to. We'll start with the basics and examine how the human heart works. The heart is a muscle about the size of a clenched fist that is located under the rib cage and between the lungs. It is divided into a left side and a right side. Each side has two chambers. 
The upper chambers are called atria, and the lower chambers are called ventricles. Blood flows from the atria to the ventricles through one-way valves. The atria and the ventricles work together as a team to pump blood through the heart. The right atrium receives oxygen-depleted blood from the body and pushes it into the right ventricle, which pumps it out to the lungs. Oxygen-enriched blood is returned from the lungs to the left atrium, which pushes it into the left ventricle, where it is pumped back out to the body. After the body has used all of the oxygen in the blood, the blood returns to the heart and the cycle repeats. In a normal heart, this sequence occurs 60 to 100 times per minute. The heart's beating rhythms are driven by electrical impulses within the heart. In a normal heart rhythm, electrical signals originate in the heart's natural pacemaker, the sinoatrial node, also called the SA node. These electrical signals travel from the atria to the ventricles in a defined rhythmic pattern. The electrical signals pass through the atrioventricular, or AV node. The AV node acts as a natural gatekeeper for the heart, through which all the heart's electrical signals must pass, is what she was going to say, but we're going to talk about the conducting system more in a minute. But if, if we look at our picture here, all right, so here's the right atrium, here's the left atrium, and here the AV valves are open, right? So Blood is flowing from here into here, and you see that the aortic and pulmonary uh, uh, valves are closed. If we fast forward just a little bit, we can see, uh, well, let's find it. Okay, so here now the heart is in systole, so the AV valves are both closed, right? And the aortic and pulmonary valves are open as blood is being pushed out to the lungs from the right side of the heart and out to the body through the left side of the heart. All right, so it's um, this uh, little movie, I think, uh, and does a pretty good job at showing you what that looks like in motion. All right, <clears throat> so the, uh, the bicuspid and the tricuspid valves, you know, are inside the heart um, and between the atria and ventricles, so they're very hard to work on. So when a patient has a problem with an AV valve, there oftentimes isn't very much that anybody can do about it because we don't, we don't have an easy, quick way to replace those valves because they're complicated. You know, they've, they've got those little cordite tendinite, those little strings. The papillary muscles are all part of that. So we can't do very much with those. But with the aortic and pulmonary valves, which we call the semi-lunar valves, we can actually replace those with um, a prosthetic or, a, or a, a false valve. So normally, you know, this is what the valve look like, looks like when it's open. This is what it looks like when it's closed. So you can see they get their name semi-lunar because, you know, this surface and this surface look like crescent moons a little bit. So this is closed, this is open. Well, in a sick valve, the leaflets are sort of stiff. So when they come together, they don't seal entirely. So if you look at this picture here, you can sort of see that the center isn't quite closed. That means that blood is going to be rushing backwards through this non-closed valve. You know, it's supposed to be totally closed, but it's not. So we'll end up with a condition where when the heart is relaxing, blood is going to flow from the aorta back into the ventricles. So it makes the heart much less efficient. You know, imagine trying to pump up a bicycle tire that has a hole in it. It's that same kind of idea. You know, you keep pumping, but because the air is going in the wrong direction, it's not staying put, you end up doing much more effort. So when we have a valve that's like this, because the aortic and pulmonary valves sit sort of just outside the heart in the vessels, they're much easier to get at and fix. So what, one of the ways that this is done is um, a semi-lunar valve from a pig is sort of mounted in a classic mesh type uh, ring, and then this, the old valve is taken out and the new valve is stitched in place, and we can fix this problem by replacing the valve. You will encounter patients who've had valve replacement or valve repair. Um, you know, so this is just one example. You know, this isn't really a testing slide as much as it's just a little clinical relevance. So we can take these valves because they're so simple 
we can replace them um, either with the pig version. Um, there are also fully synthetic ones too that are essentially made of very high tech plastic um, that move quite a bit like um, these, uh, these valves in the heart do. So semi linear valves are replaceable. The AV valves, not as much. All right. So, you know, whenever we talk about the heart, um, one of the reasons that it comes up clinically so frequently is because of this particular disorder, which is called coronary artery disease. So, you know, we've all heard of it. This is what gives people heart attacks, right? Um, and the, the problem in coronary artery disease is that the arteries, the coronary arteries, have uh, developed uh, what are called plaques which are internal restrictions to blood flow. So this is an artery under the microscope. It, the, the opening or the, the lumen where the blood flows should be about this big. You know, it should be all the way out here. But this giant thing right here is what we call a plaque or a de lipid deposit. So its presence has reduced the size of this vessel to just this little tiny piece right here. So, you know, if you've ever played around with straws at all, you know that the smaller the straw is, the harder it is to move anything through it, right? So when an artery, it, when its effective size is shrunk like this, blood can't pass through as easily. So whatever's on the, the downstream side of this doesn't get enough blood, and when you don't get enough blood, if you're a cell, you don't get enough oxygen either, and you have trouble. So we have all kinds of ways of studying the heart, and this is one. So in red here are the coronary arteries. This is what it's supposed to look like. Nice, smooth borders on the inside, dark red that shows that there's plenty of blood flow there. And then when we look between the coronary arteries at this green and blue area, this is a happy heart. You know, so these green and blues mean that uh, oxygen is being delivered to the, these areas of the heart. Um, if we look over here, we see just the opposite. We see this problem. So, you know, like here's this whole big black area right here where the, uh, the heart doesn't even show up. That's an area of the heart that's not getting adequate blood supply. So why would that be? Well, the likely culprit is right here. So if you look at these arteries, they're, they're nice and smooth, solid lines, right? Well, here there's sort of a gap or an empty space right here. This is, and here's a dark spot right here, this is a way of showing how, uh, uh, what arteries look like that aren't getting enough blood supply. So we either have a clot or a, a plaque here, and this looks like a clot here. So it's uh, restricting blood flow to this area of the heart. Um, so this is either a heart attack or a heart attack waiting to happen, um, because this heart muscle right here is not getting an adequate blood supply. So there's all kinds of things we can do about this problem. Um, uh, one is called a bypass graft, and that's where uh, uh, a vein from the leg or from the arm or from the chest is actually sort of attached right here and then attached to an artery that sits up here to sort of bypass the blockage. Um, so that's one approach. When people talk about having double or triple bypass surgery, that's how many uh, bypasses did they have? In other words, they didn't have multiple surgeries. They had one surgery, but um, you know, like if we were to uh, attach uh, a vein here to help with this blood flow, that's one. But then if we were to attach and then a different vein here, let's say, then that would be a, a double bypass. A triple would be three attachments, quadruple four. All right, so that's one approach. That's major surgery, though. You're talking about cracking open the chest. Um, you're talking about open the pericardial sac, finding the coronary arteries, and then doing your work. Very intensive surgery, right? So we want to have some uh, options that don't require that degree of surgery. And one of those is shown here. It's called angioplasty. And what, what we do in this is we take a catheter, which is just a very thin tube, like a, a long, super long IV. We put it in the, the femoral artery, and we can sort of guide it up to the heart. And we sort of lodge it in like a spot like this, where there's been a restriction in blood flow. And then once we get there, 
we have a little balloon that's uh, uh, covering this catheter that we can inflate and essentially it pushes the artery open. So it, it sort of forces an expansion of that artery to allow more blood to flow through. Sometimes that's enough, or at least it's enough for a little while. One of the problems with angioplasty is the arteries have a tendency to then shrink back down because you know the problem hasn't really been fixed. You just have sort of helped it. So uh, in addition to an angioplasty, sometimes we put in what's called a stent. And a stent is kind of like a wire cage that sort of props an artery open in its expanded state and can help to uh, uh, prevent the need for bypass surgery, which um, of course has a lot of risks associated with it. So there are all kinds of uh, treatments for coronary artery disease, but they tend to fall into two categories. And that is the surgical ones, where you have to open up the chest to do the work. And then what we call interventional radiology, where it isn't surgery, it's something that's done using a catheter <clears throat> or some tool that's uh, uh, worked from the inside of the blood vessels on out. All right. <clears throat> okay, so let's put some of these things in motion. We've looked at the valves, we've looked at the coronary arteries, we've looked at um, the heart's anatomy. So, you know, let's put the system in motion and see what a cardiac cycle is like. All right. So we have atria and we have systole. Or, sorry, we have atria and we have ventricles. Atria contract and relax. Ventricles contract and relax. And they do so in a regular pattern. So uh, we start the cardiac cycle with both the atria and the ventricles relaxed. So that's atrial diastole and ventricular diastole. So when it's time for a heartbeat, the first thing that happens in that is that the atria contract. So we have atrial systole. And in our picture down here, so here's relaxation. This is like this area right here. And then when the atria contract, you can see that they change shape. So like the right atrium goes from having a, a convex wall on the right to having a concave wall on, on, uh, in uh, contraction. <clears throat> in the human heart, the atria are sort of wimpy. Um, they have very thin walls, as you saw in the sheep heart, because um, it's uh, true there too. So atrial contraction, it doesn't do a lot. You know, it's, it isn't dramatic. Like, it's not like the atria you know, really push blood into the ventricle. It's more of a little kick is all that you get from the atria. But it does help to fill the, uh, the left and right ventricles so that when they contract, they can be more effective. So in atrial systole, which is right here, the atria contract. Now note that the ventricles are still relaxed. So the pattern is the atria contract and then the ventricles contract and then the whole heart relaxes. And then, and then that repeats. So after atrial systole, which is here, the next thing that happens is the ventricles begin to contract. So ventricular systole, which is here. As the, the first thing that happens when the ventricles collapse is that thing won't explode, by the way. It's just our air system. I know it sounds like something bad's going to happen, but it won't. It'll blow off in there in a minute. <clears throat> um, Let's see, so when the ventricle starts to, uh, to contract, the first thing that happens is the AV valves close. So see here they're open in atrial systole so blood can flow through. But once the ventricles start to contract, they slam shut. When valves close, they close with a snap, usually. And because they close like that, when valves close, they make a sound. So when you listen to your heartbeat or listen to a patient's heartbeat, the, the sound you hear, the love dub, is the sound of valves closing. So the first sound you hear, the love, is this spot right here where the, <clears throat> where the left and right AV valves are slammed shut at the beginning of ventric ventricular systole. And then as the ventricles continue to contract, eventually they push open the uh, pulmonary trunk or the pulmonic valve and the aortic valve and blood starts to be pushed into the circulation. So this is ventricular systole. And then uh, that proceeds for a while, and then the heart uh, starts to relax, 
and we get into ventricular diastole. So if we look at our pattern, we have atrial systole for a little short time, and then we have a long atrial diastole, right? So the atria don't do very much. And then for the ventricle, we have uh, ventricular systole, and then we have ventricular diastole, or relaxation. So what's interesting is even though the heart's job is to pump blood around the body, it's only actually doing that job about one-third of the time. So if we look at this whole cycle, we can see that systole is only about a third of this entire cycle, right? Now, that can change. You know, if you were to uh, uh, begin exercising, for example, um, the ventricular systole gets a little longer, and the ventricular diastole gets significantly shorter. So this uh, ratio of sort of one to, or, or one third to two thirds can change depending on what the body is up to or what the body is doing. All right. So these words, systole and diastole, when you hear them all by themselves, in other words, somebody has said uh, the patient is, you know, is in systole. Well, what are they talking about? Usually they're talking about the ventricles. Because the atria don't do very much, when we talk about systole and diastole, we're usually talking about the ventricles. So unless somebody has specified atrial systole or atrial diastole, what they mean is ventricular, um, because that's what we talk about. So, you know, we've all heard of blood pressure. There's a systolic number and a diastolic number, right? Well, the systolic number is the heart in systole. The diastolic number is the heart in diastole. So those words associated with blood pressure are directly related to these, uh, to what the heart is up to. So the higher number is the, the pressure generated by the heart when it's contracting. The lower number is the pressure that remains in the system while the heart is relaxing. So systolic and diastolic. All right. <clears throat> so as the heart does its thing and contracts and relaxes, it has different phases. And in these different phases, different things are happening. So <clears throat> your book gives sort of two ways of looking at the same thing. One is in pictures like this, and another is in um, a, a pressure graph, which we're going to look at in the next slide. But <clears throat> the two are connected. Those two slides or those two pictures are connected. So you can see these numbers here, one, two, three, four, you know, all the way around to eight. In the next slide, in this one, the, the numbers that you see here are the same numbers that you see in this one. Because that graph gives some important new information, but everybody hates graphs, right? They're, they're hard to look at, they're hard to know what they're talking about. So what the book has done is has sort of made pictures to go with the graph so that you'll know, so you'll be able to make connections. All right. So we're going to go through this whole cycle. So once again, we start with the heart and diastole. Um, so the atria are relaxed and the ventricles are relaxed. <clears throat> so blood is flowing in from the body to the right atrium, flowing in from the lungs to the left atrium, and flowing right into the ventricles because the valves are open. Well, at the start of diastole, so um, the, the pacemaker has triggered a heartbeat. And we're going to talk about that uh, probably next time. Um, <clears throat> the first thing that happens is the atria contract. So here's atrial systole, right? The, um, the, they change shape a little bit, they push in, and they push blood from the atria into the ventricle. So uh, both, on both sides are pushing blood into here. So atrial systole. So then uh, the uh, atria relax, and the ventricles start to contract. All right, so in the first phase of ventricular uh, systole, the ventricles start to contract, and the first thing that happens is the AV valves close. So see, here are AV valves open, but now the AV valves are closed. And here we have sort of an interesting spot in the cardiac cycle. All four valves are closed. So the AV valves are closed, and the aortic and pulmonary valves are also closed. So if all the valves are closed, that means that blood can't go anywhere, right? So blood can't enter the heart and it can't leave the heart. 
which means that the volume or the size of the ventricles can't change because in order to get smaller, a valve is going to have to open. So during this first phase of ventricular systole, what's happening is the heart is building up pressure. You know, our muscle cells and our cardiac muscle cells, they, they can't uh, uh, contract instantaneously, right? It takes them time to contract and make that motion. So in this first phase of ventricular systole, we call this isovolumetric contraction. Iso is same, volumetric is volume. So we're saying that the heart is contracting, but it isn't getting smaller yet. Instead, it's building up pressure. Because what needs to happen is the, the ventricles have to build up enough pressure to push the aortic and pulmonary valves open, or else blood isn't going to move. So that's that first phase of ventricular systole, isovolumetric contraction. All right, so then we get to number five. Once the pressure in the ventricles becomes greater than the pressure in the aorta and pulmonary trunks, okay, now those valves open. When valves open, they don't make any sounds. It's only when valves close that they make a sound, right? So once the exit doors are open, now the heart can start doing its job, which is to pump blood out of itself and into the circulation. So during the second phase of ventricular systole, the uh, blood is leaving the heart. So we call this ventricular ejection. So the, the ventricle is ejecting blood from the heart through the aorta and the pulmonary trunk. All right, so that's step number five. In step number six, okay, so after uh, contraction occurs, the heart gets smaller and smaller and smaller as it pushes blood out until eventually it sort of tires out and it starts to relax again. Once it starts to relax, the first thing that happens there is the aortic and the pulmonary valves, bam, snap shut. Why? Because as the heart starts to relax, the blood in the aorta and the pulmonary trunk is, is under more pressure than the ventricles have in the moment. So the blood tries to flow backwards. When it tries to flow backwards, it slams that valve shut, and then we hear the second heart sound. So the first heart sound are the AV valves closing here. The second heart sound, the love dub. Love is the first one, dub is the second one. Well, the dub we get as the aortic and pulmonary valves close. So then here in step six, or I'm sorry, in step seven, we have a similar situation to uh, here in step four. And that is all, all the valves are closed. So the exit valves are closed and the entry valves are closed which means that blood can't enter or leave the heart at that time. So we have, this is isovolumetric relaxation. So the heart isn't changing size, but it is relaxing. The pressure in the ventricles is falling. And once the pressure in the ventricles falls low enough to be less than that in the atria, then boom, the AV valves open again. And the heart starts to fill back up so it can do this whole routine again, all right? So <clears throat> phases of the cardiac cycle, you know, atrial systole. Ventricular systole has two parts. In the first phase, we're building up pressure. All the valves are closed. In the second phase, we're actually injecting blood into the circulation. <clears throat> and then in relaxation, we sort of have a first phase or an early, where again, all the valves are closed, but the heart is relaxing. And then <clears throat> in the second phase, uh, or the late phase of diastole, finally the AV valves open and the heart can start to fill again. All right, so phases of the cardiac cycle, and this goes round and round and round. All right, here's another way of looking at that same thing that shows you a little more detail about why the valves open and close. All right, so anytime you have a messy graph like this, be sure you know what you're looking at. You know, and once you start to know what you're looking at, it can start to make sense. All right, so here at the top, this is uh, just what the atria and ventricles are doing. So here's atrial diastole, here's systole, diastole again, systole, right? And then under it is the ventricles. So ventricular diastole, relaxation, ventricular systole, and then diastole again, okay? And then for our, our graph, the axis here, the y-axis, is pressure. 
So this is pressure in uh, uh, various spots of the heart. So the black line here at the top, that's in the, in the aorta. So this is pressure in the aorta over a cardiac cycle. The red line is pressure in the ventricle, the left ventricle in particular. And then the blue line is pressure in the atrium. All right, so we can see all those same spots that we just saw in the previous slide, but we can see how, uh, how they impact pressures. All right, so let's start at the beginning. So at point number one, the atria is relaxing and the ventricles are relaxing. So we have a very low pressure. Here, where did my mouse go? Okay, so we have very low pressure because there isn't any contraction happening, right? So the, at number one here, at number two, we see atrial systole. Okay, so that's this range. So as the atria contract, we see a small increase in pressure in the left atrium and in the left ventricle. Why in the left ventricle? because the AV valve is open. So as the uh, atria contract, that pressure is pushed into the ventricle as well as uh, into itself. So we have this little bump of atrial systole. After atrial systole, we have ventricular systole. So now the ventricles are gonna contract. Contraction generates pressure. So as soon as it starts to contract, we see that the pressure in the left ventricle, our red line here, starts to shoot up. Right? Well, the first thing that happens right here is the pressure in the ventricle, red line, exceeds or becomes greater than the pressure in the left atrium. So when the red line crosses the blue line, that's when the AV valves close. Bam. Because when the pressure on one side of the valve is greater than the other, blood is going to try to flow down that pressure gradient. And, is, and that causes the valve to close. The parachute fills up, and boom, it slams shut. So that's point number three here, where the red line crosses the blue line. That's what triggers the closure of the AV valve. All right, so then we see this red line increasing, but nothing else happening. This is that isovolumetric contraction. So the ventricle is building up pressure, but it isn't getting smaller yet. Why? Because all the valves are closed. You know, the aortic valve is closed from the last cycle. The AV valve is closed, so blood can't go anywhere. So we see the ventricle building up pressure. Now, when the pressure in the ventricle exceeds the pressure in the aorta, in other words, when the red line crosses the black line, that's going to pop that aortic valve open. And then once that occurs, as the heart continues to develop uh, pressure, now blood is leaving the heart. So in this area right here, this curve, this is blood actually leaving the heart. The heart's actually doing its job pumping blood into the circulation. So that's number five, is injection, that big long arch. Now right about here, the heart starts to relax. So you see the pressure, instead of continuing to get bigger, it starts to drop off and then it starts to get lower again. Well, as the heart, as the ventricle uh, relaxes, Eventually, the pressure falls, and then here at number six, the red line crosses the black line. In other words, the pressure in the ventricle becomes less than the pressure in the aorta. Blood tries to flow backwards, and boom, it closes those aortic and pulmonic valves. So we get the second heart sound. And then in number seven here, um, this is the heart continuing to relax, even though all the valves are closed. So it relaxes, relaxes, relaxes. And then when the red line crosses the blue line again, so it crosses here, causing the valve to close. When it crosses here, now the AV valves open, and we start to get a refilling then of the ventricle getting ready to contract again. All right, so if we're, if we're listening to, with the stethoscope, what we hear is we hear a lub and a dub, or a lub dub, as uh, some of you would say. So why a love here? Because we're hearing the AV valves close, and then the dub comes as we hear the aortic and pulmonary valves close. An important point, we have four valves that make two sounds. So how can that be? Because they happen at the same time. So both AV valves close at the same time. The aortic and pulmonary valves both close at the same time. So when we listen to the heart, we hear only two sounds, we're actually hearing four things happen 
but two of them are happening at the same time, and then two of them are happening at the same time. All right? So don't get confused by that. Because there are some abnormal heart sounds called S3 and S4, but it's not the other two valves that you're hearing. It's other stuff. All right, so, okay, let's see how good our audio system is in here. All right, so there's the lub dub, right? So the first one is the AV valves closing. The second one is the uh, pulmonary and aortic valves closing. All right, so that's what a normal heart sounds like. All right. The, uh, uh, there are two other heart sounds which are sometimes heard. All right, so S3 is heard immediately after S2, and it's caused by hearing blood flow into the ventricles. Normally, when blood is flowing, it doesn't make any sound. But if it's flowing particularly fast or not very smooth, it does make a sound. So, you know, if you're, if you're walking by a river, you know, and it's, it, when it's running smooth, it doesn't make much sound, right? But if it goes into a gully or where there's rapids, you can hear it as it sort of bubbles over the rocks. Blood is that same way. So S3 is you're hearing blood flow into the ventricles because it's a little turbulent. So you hear S3 very commonly in children because their, uh, their hearts are very strong and vigorous, so you sort of hear the blood flowing through. So that's S3. And then in S4, um, you can hear atrial contraction sometimes. This one is commonly heard in uh, athletes. So these aren't abnormal. It doesn't mean your heart is sick if you have an S3 or an S4. Um, we just don't hear them in most people. All right, so this should be an S3. Uh, so do you see hear how there's an extra sound in there? Do, do, do. Yeah, so that's an S3. There will not be audio on the test, I promise. All right. So that's, that's an S4, which you can't really hear in this room. But if you had headphones on, you could. All right. All right, and there are, uh, because of how the valves are arranged in the heart, there are spots where you can listen to one valve as opposed to another. So any of you that are going to learn how to do physical examinations or assessments, um, you'll probably learn about these four spots. Um, so like you can hear the aortic valve um, best sort of uh, um, here, whereas you can hear the, uh, the left AV valve here. Again, this is more clinical that I'm going to test you on, but just know that there are different spots where you can listen to different valves um, uh, more specifically. Ventricular contraction causes the... Yes? Is there ever a time someone have all four of those? As, yes, you can have all four. How does that just don't hear the four? Yeah, you'll, you'll hear, it's, it sort of sounds like a galloping horse. You know, because as a, if you listen to the hoof falls, it's doo 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 doo, and that's sort of what you'll hear in somebody who has all four. And there again, a, like a marathon runner, an ultra marathoner, very highly trained, you might hear all four. And how do you how can you differentiate between hearing all four and that it's not just the heartbeat going on? That's that's not the practice. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. All right. This should be our last thing. Ventricular contraction causes the atrioventricular valves to close, this is which signals the, the beginning heart of ventricular systole. The semilunar valves were closed during the previous diastole and remain closed during this period. Continued ventricular contraction increases pressure in the ventricles above the pressure in the aorta and pulmonary trunk, causing the semilunar valves to open. When the ventricles relax and their pressures drop, blood flowing back toward the relaxed ventricles causes the semilunar valves to close, which is the beginning of ventricular diastole. Note that the atrioventricular valves remain closed. When the pressure in the ventricles becomes lower than the pressure in the atria, 
the atrioventricular valves open and blood flows into the relaxed ventricles. This accounts for most of the ventricular filling. The atria then contract and complete the ventricular filling. And then the whole thing starts over again. So this is sort of a step-by-step. -step. Um, so relaxation, passive filling, so this is late diastole, atrial, uh, systole, right? Then the next thing would be the ventricles would start to contract. This valve would close. Eventually, this valve opens, pushes blood out. As the ventricle starts to relax, blood flowing backwards closes this valve. The continued relaxation eventually opens this valve, and then we get a repeat. All right. All right, so blood flowing into the heart from the vena cava Whoop. flows next through which of those things? So that's both the inferior and superior vena cava that we're talking about. Oh, it won't? Not good. Do you not have signal in the room? Huh? Oh, well. We're about out of time anyway. Okay, so where does blood, there's only like seven of you, so somebody answer the question. Blood flowing from the vena cava uh, into the atrium, where does it go first? So the vena cava uh, returns blood from the body, right? So where does blood from the body get to the heart? Anyone? I put the on the right. Right atrium, good. And then, so the first valve it's going to encounter is going to be the right AV valve. So what else do we call the right AV valve? The tricuspid, good. So the correct answer there would be C, tricuspid. All right, what's the next question? Um, what do the atria do? A, B, C, D, or E. You can just shout your answer out. You know. Good, E. Yes. Because, yes, the atria collect blood. So what do we mean by that? When the heart, when the ventricles are contracting, the blood is still coming back from the body. It's not like things take a break while the heart's doing its thing. So when the ventricles are contracting and pushing blood out, the atria are still out there collecting blood that's returning from the heart. So as soon as the ventricle is, uh, starts to relax, that blood is collected is then it sort of whooshes in and then followed by that little pump to, to pump it back in um, and then uh, pushed out. All right, folks, that is it for today. Um, and... It is looking like, you know, on, in your schedule,